What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Police Off the Cuff After Hours. My name is uh, Mark DeMeo. I'm your host. I'm here with my co-host, my partner in all things law enforcement, the very handsome Bill Cannon. What's up, Bill? Great to be here, man. And I'm with one of my buddies from like, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. We took a comedy class together and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> Dude, we could have ta- taught that comedy class, Bill. <laughs> I'm really, really excited about our guest tonight. Uh, he's an accomplished actor. He's been in, I mean, you got to see his, this, his IMDP page puts mine to shame. Um, he's been in the movie Patriot Day. What was the line in the movie Patriot Day, Bill? Let, let, Cliff, to- let Cliff say it. <laughs> I don't know which line you mean. Oh, uh, yeah, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> Welcome to Watertown, motherfucker. There you go. <laughs> and he had that Boston accent, too. No yeah, one else can yeah. say it like that. Well, you got to yeah. deliver it the right way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, he's also appeared in the TV show uh, Billions, um, a movie that I love a lot. Uh, it's it's a really you gotta it's an intense movie by these directors i gotta i don't know their name hopefully cliff will tell me good time uh, that's a great movie uh it, it, your heart will be in your throat manifest which is a show that i was watching with my girl um my fiance and um we got in thro- we got into that freaking thing we didn't know it was going to end and i'm going to ask you which part you played in that in a little while uh boardwalk empire on HBO, a series that was probably one of my uh, favorite series ever. And not only that, but he's in the the new feature film, uh, Ray Donovan, which I love that show. And they're making a movie out of it. He's got a part in there. So let's welcome tonight a Boston native, Cliff Moylan. What's up? Guys, thanks for having me on. <laughs> Cliff, it's, a, it's, such, it's so cool to have you on because... So I, you know, I, I stay in, I talk to you every once in a while by, uh, by phone, but I haven't seen you in a couple of years and you look great. And I'm so happy that you're doing well in the acting biz, which has got to be the toughest biz in the world. You know? Dude, I'm proud of you. You really made something of this podcast. Well, you know, you, you have a yeah, yeah. An ama- tremendous following and you have the amazing guests. Thank yeah. you. Well, yeah, that's yeah. why you're on. <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know, the guest they had on prior to me is living legend FBI agent. Joe Pastone, uh, the guy who played Don, the guy who portrayed himself as Donnie Brasco, infiltrating the Bonanno crime family in the late 1970s. Yeah, yeah. Bill is um, Bill and I put this thing together, and uh, you know I got divorced, so I, I still have to work. Congratulations, <laughs> retired, and I'm a stand-up comedy and I'm an actor, and we have this pocket. I still have to work, but uh, Bill has been holding the ship down and doing amazing things. You know, he's a uh, He's his, he's doing what he used to do on the job, which is take control. I knew he could do it. I told him he was doing that to do it with the SBA. But uh, we're here, man. We're doing it. The numbers are great. And uh, we're happy to have you. Um, go ahead, Bill. Sarah Morris from Ohio. We got people from all over the country listening to this show, and they must have heard the great actor Cliff Moylan was coming on because we're getting people. Uh, we better get some people from Ireland. Because we always get people from Ireland. Now we have an Irish guy on. We'll probably get no one from Ireland. You know? yeah, I but, got a lot of cousins, man. Maybe well, they better, be watch, they better be watching. Cliff, let me ask you something. I mean, it's so amazing. Right now, I, I saw your background as far as you, you haven't just tried to be an actor. You've studied to be an mm-hmm. actor. You've studied mm-hmm. hard. And yeah. right now, you're studying with the great actor, Chaz Palminteri. How's that going? It's been a little while. It's been a little while. Uh, I... You know, it's been a, a long while, but I took his class. I didn't even know he had a class. Yeah, he's the best teacher I've ever had in my entire life. I would have taken it. Yeah, he's the best teacher I've ever had in my entire life. He talks the way people talk, you know? I mean, he, a lot of um, acting teachers, they, they get a little heady. They get a little, uh, I don't know. There's some of the language they use is a little flaky. Chaz doesn't talk like that. He talks like you, you would expect him to talk. What the fuck are you actually saying? <laughs> uh-huh. 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 Where's the fucking love between you two? Uh-huh. Show us the love, you know. You, you know, um, I, I had um, shit. I, I I used to do this show line. I was in the Thirteenth Street uh, Theater Company repertory. That was uh, I studied at HB. You went to William Esper, right? Yeah, in addition to a few others. Yeah, I went to HB Studios, and then I got into the 13th Street acting. Uh, and I was in this play called Line, and I used to play the same part that Chaz played when he was in the 13th, 13th Street rep. 
And uh, one night he came to see the show, and I did it. It was a Get out I, of here, I played, really? yeah, I played Fleming, so I had a chance to talk to him um, after the show, and that was remarkable. And I've met him a couple of uh, times after that. As a matter of fact, I was doing stand up in Atlantic City, and next door he was doing the one man show. Now this is like we're going back like four years. He was doing, um, you know, Bronx, his, Bronx Tale, the Bronx Tale, Broadway. but he was yeah. doing Atlantic City right next door. I wanted to go see it, but I was actually freaking headlining the room next door so then after it was done i went over there they brought me right up to the front right away and uh i had a chance to talk to him again about how i met him at uh at the show line and um he motivated you know i i have a one-man show too and a lot of it ha has to credit with uh with Chaz, like seeing Dude, what he did with you the haven't bronx seen tale. a bronx tale as a one-man show i highly recommend it he does 18 characters you he holds your interest the entire time it is. I mean, you think you know something about the story. We all do, but by seeing the movie, maybe even the musical. That movie lives as a one-man show. He, he he blew me away. Chaz, my acting resume. I think I met Chaz around the same time I met you, Bill. My acting resume. It had a it had a couple of you know, it had a couple of credits. The last day of class, I get up to go to the bathroom. My agent calls, Cliff. You just booked the night of. Oh yeah, I love that series. That was while I'm on the phone with my agent, my manager calls, Cliff. You just booked the following. I went and I sit down. I check my phone again just to be sure. I booked House of Cards. Wow. The, the class Chaz taught was an audition technique class. I do believe the things I learned in that class helped me book those jobs. That was September 14th, 2000. So September 15th, 2014. By September 15th, 2015, I booked 15 TV shows and a George Clooney, Julia Roberts movie. Wow. I, I do believe it was things I learned in that class that helped me. Obviously, so, so yeah. I took that class again. I took the class again. I took his audition class technique four times. That might seem a bit excessive to some people, but I, I know my brain. I'm a bit stubborn. I needed to have what he was teaching drilled in and never, ever, ever, ever forget it. Then he taught a, um, he taught a one-man show class, which I benefited greatly from. There was a buddy of mine, I'm going to say his name, Mike Massimino, real good friend. After I took Chaz's class once, Mike took it with me a second time, and then he took it with me the next three. And he's, he's been in his class a bunch, too. And, dude, I'm not saying this is going to happen to everybody, but Chaz has been very uh, – he's been very generous to Mike and I. You know, he's very very supportive of our careers. And when I met Mike, I mean, you know, we were kind of struggling. We kind of worked here and there. Dude, he and I have a similar trajectory. It's really cool to be on a path with somebody, you know, similar. The, Mike is working. And it's really a pleasure to see. And it affords me the opportunity to be happy for somebody else who keeps showing up. Now, every time I book an acting job, I gain a fake friend and I lose a fake friend. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Mike's always there. Mike, Mike is my friend. And a lot of the times the people that get jealous are the people that aren't really doing the work. You, know, you Most people who want acting careers, they want the results. They don't want to do the work. This shit is fucking hard. Seriously, you wouldn't want to get those credits that I have on IMDb. Most people wouldn't want to do, wouldn't want to go through what I've gone through. There's been days I've walked home de depressed out of my mind. There's been months, years, I was just miserable. So I feel it necessary to mentor actors. Anytime an actor, anytime an actor asks me for help or guidance, the answer is always yes. I say, get a pen and paper. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. And I tell them the basics. And, you know, the basics could be read this book, get a headshot, get yourself in an acting class. Um, and then check in with me in three months. So few people actually check back. It is what it is. Because they don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the work. Right. No, but, Cliff, you, you know, can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. And I really just got to scratch the surface a little in acting. I took mm -hmm. classes for like maybe two or three years, but I, I, it's definitely not enough, you know. And then COVID hit, and I, I didn't think it was going to be advantageous to take acting classes on Zoom. So I've stopped since COVID. I mean, I would like to go back 
once you can actually do it in person again. But I, I wouldn't, I didn't see that doing acting classes on Zoom would benefit me too much. You well, know? you uh, you pursued comedy, which I kind of halfway gave up on because I, I saw your um. Yeah, <laughs> so you show you show uh, yeah, yeah, after when your class finished. Thanks. <laughs> I anyway, you, you you um, I felt like sometimes I only have enough gas in the tank for one thing, so I put comedy in the back burner. Anyway, so back to what I was saying about mentoring younger actors. Uh, an actress that I that I work with as a friend, you know, I tell her to tell her to check in with me. She was having a hard time between auditions. She's ha she's not getting her phone's not ringing. She's not seeing the right people, getting seen by the right people. And she goes, well, what do you think, Cliff? And I said, you know what I think? I hope you get the shit kicked out of you. I hope you experience so much fucking pain. And I hope you have your life is an absolute hell for the next five years. You know why? Because at the end of five years, if you're still in the game and you don't quit, you'll have a career. And that's my wish for every young actor. I hope you get the shit kicked out of you because it's possible at the end of that shit kick and you're going to have a career. But you know, I, Cliff, at this, at the same time, like all this work you're describing and I, I un totally understand where you're coming from, but at the same time you have to make a living and you got to support yourself in one of the yeah. toughest cities in the world. And that's not easy. I know you've worked as a bartender, right? I'm Still, sure you've done I'm bartending on Friday in the Hamptons. Okay, I thought you were. I thought you were totally making a living at acting right now. What? There's been spells where, that, where I did, and then the money runs out, and you have to go back to. Well, you know what's interesting <laughs> is uh, uh, reading your bio is how you packed up your stuff in Boston, and you headed to New York City, and uh, it's it's a story as as old as time. You know, people they they make their pilgrimage either it's in New York or L.A. Tell us about what that was like, because uh, I know you, you know, you probably had a good setup over there in Boston and you just, you knew you had to do it. Uh, I don't there, know. There, there's Cliff on the screen with a short haircut in case you were that wondering was, what he looked like. That, that picture is probably 10 years old. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, first of all, I left Boston at 22. Boston is my home in a lot of ways, but the Boston I miss doesn't necessarily even exist anymore. Um. I had to, I had to flee the nest. I had to see the world. You know, I've lived in New York twice and I've lived in Los Angeles for four years. Um, what? Where are you now? I live in the Lower East Side. I live near uh, Houston and C. Okay, good. We've got to hang out one night. I'll, uh, you come to a show. I'd love that. I'd love yeah. that. Thanks for the we'll invite. Hang. We'll bounce around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be yeah. fun. Boy, this neighborhood changed. <sighs> The yeah, Lower East yeah. Side, yeah. Hope it fucked it right up, man. I have to kick five junkies off my step just to leave my house. Yeah, it's, it's incredible, man. Yeah. <laughs> We're going a, back to 1991. It's, you got to look over your shoulder now. It's an interesting thing. It's like boom, most people aren't even aware of it, but that guy got hit. First of all, the guy got hit in the head with a, a hatchet uh, at the ATM, and now another guy waiting for a train got hit in the back of the head by a guy with a hammer. So there's no you can't relax anywhere you no. go right now i don't want to no. scare the shit out of people but th this stuff is happening in the news nobody's even really talking about it mm -mm. and if you if you put hands on somebody in self-defense you're you're at risk of getting arrested and charged yourself we had a guy here that uh, he jumped in the middle of uh what was his name again bill he jumped in the middle of uh this lady getting stabbed in the, in yeah. the, in the upper torso with a knife Obviously, he's stabbed, but um, he, he, I don't know how he did it, man. The guy just, he came in in one second, saved this girl's, this woman's life, and he, uh, he, he subdued the person. And wouldn't you know it, once he had him kind of sort of subdued, a lot of people jumped in. One guy held his leg, the other guy held his oh, arm. Oh, I saw the footage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and then, that and you, but you, Cliff, you want to know something? He wasn't even acknowledged by the no. politicians. The mayor didn't Disgusting. call him. The governor didn't call him. Disgusting. The police Nobody. commissioner. No one acknowledged yeah. him because they didn't want to talk about crime. You know. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah, but they'll have a party in Central Park and they're dancing. Did you see that freaking stupid video with them dancing? Oh god! Oh my god! Oh, oh with Schumer. Bill De Blasio. Well, no, it was actually it was Schumer, Schumer dancing with um, the late night host uh, Colbert, and uh, it's just. It may, it's cringe. You know that I don't like using the words uh, that, yeah, that they use nowadays, but 
it's cringeworthy, man. I mean, it'll, make, it'll make you cringe when you yeah. watch that video. Like with all the stuff that's going on all over the world, like Afghanistan and stuff like that, and the open border, and then like these people just like pretending like none of this is going on. They make decisions for people, for other people's lives that they don't have to live through, you know. No, look at Nancy Pelosi. She just had um, she just had a, 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 a you know how they, they the fundraiser, and uh, the the only people wearing a mask were the servers. Which is interesting in a way. It's so very symbolic. But yeah, it's symbolic, but it's also stupid. It's like, why can you sit there uh, elbow to elbow and I got to walk around here with a mask right now? What, what are we doing? It's so yeah. freaking stupid. Yeah. Uh, Sarah from the UK, thank you for watching. Uh, Chick Eastwater. Uh, so many people from all over the world watching this podcast. Folks, if you're not subscribed to Police Off the Cuff, please go on our YouTube hit the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, click that bell. We now also have a channel members on YouTube. We have four levels. Uh, the bucket for the lowest level. Polish My Rack is the second one. Uh, dipped in Butter is the third, the third tier. And the highest tier is Warm Dipped in Butter. Uh, from what I'm hearing, we already have 10 people, 10 members in our, uh, in our brand new um, YouTube membership. And we actually have 54 Patreon members. So also you can join our Patreon. We appreciate all of the, uh, you know, all of your support. And uh, believe it or not, this, this podcast um, business is not easy and you got to keep at it. I just got word today that we just booked Sammy the Bull Gravano and I'll, I'll confirm the date as uh, he has a, an amazing podcast himself. Yeah, I'm just... It's unbelievable. He's a great storyteller. That should be uh, something. He's a great storyteller. And he's, I'll tell you the date probably in, within a couple of days, but I don't want to confirm it till all the all the pieces are in place because I don't like to uh, count my chicks before they hatch, as they say. You know what I mean? But it's it's pretty much, yeah, the Sammy the Bull will be on. Um, Low e Margaret Hearn, you're Irish, right? Low East Side, New York City, not the same now. It's filthy rats everywhere, random violence. Oh, especially is against it not the same elderly. Or is it, did it just go back to what it used to be? Well, it was probably it worse. Was, it in, was junky heaven. I mean, in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean we need to go back to that. And hey, uh, when it was junky heaven in the nineties, you could you could do something. You could say, "Hey, get the fuck off my stoop!" Without you know, mm -hmm. I don't know repercussions. Now, now, I mean. Yeah, you just got to step the, the over. Laws on, the law's on their side. Yeah, just yeah. apologize when you're stepping over. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right my, right. my bad. My yeah, bad. Am I in your way? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let me ask you something. Um, I love the movie Good Time. I mentioned that when I introduced you. Dude, those um, guys are talented. Those uh, Very talented. There's two of them, right? Uh, what, the brothers? Josh, ben and Josh Safdie. Yep. And uh, they make these movies that are very high adrenaline. Like mm -hmm. um, the like other one gems, that they made, you couldn't, You couldn't. You were, I was on the edge of my seat for two hours. Well, uh, they didn't they also make the one with um Adam Sandler too? Um, the, Uncut Gems, Uncut Gems. So, uh -huh. w if you watch Uncut Gems or if you watch Good Time, either one, you'll notice this the, the way the films are. It's such high address, the, the pace of it is so fast, and just when you think nothing else could go wrong. Uh, something else goes wrong. And it's one of those things where, like, if you're watching the movie, when it's done, you're bugging out right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But when you're when you're actually, what, first of all, what part did you play in it? And how do you know the pace of that when you're when you're acting in it? I don't know if, um, you know, actors talk about things like pace and tone. I'm not sure that's my jurisdiction. You know, I mean, I think one I'm of the worst things... Because an actor can do is over over complicate something yeah that, that's I, uh, good you said that i i cannot act and direct at the same time so when the director gives me direction i i follow it to a t and um it, it helps my acting um you know it's like you, any ship needs one captain and that is it um as far as good time goes i mean there was no mistaking that the stakes were high you know, it was very um, every every scene had a sense of urgency, and you know, impending doom was around the corner at every every turn. Um, I didn't know it was going to be as good as it was, though. I, mean, I saw it in the theater. I'm like, oh my god, I'm part of this. That movie was amazing, and yeah. I, 
not only are those two gentlemen in a pleasure to work with, there's something specific I like about them is they, they cast people like Adam Sandler, like Robert Pattinson, and they bring something out of them that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Nobody ever saw Adam Sandler like that. Yeah. He was great. He, it wasn't safe. There was no aspect of that, that movie that was safe. And Adam Sandler's acting conveyed that, as well as Robert Pattinson. Yeah, they're you know, both Cliff, great. Cliff, when you talk about even like um, comics that are good actors, when you think of Robin Williams, I liked Robin Williams' acting much more than I liked his comedy. His comedy He's made me actor. like nervous. He was a, good actor. He was a great actor, I oh, thought, yeah. but I didn't love oh, yeah. him as a, as a comic. I really didn't. I just thought he made me tense watching his comedy. You know? Dude, you know who's a great example of that was um, Rodney Dangerfield in Natural Born Killers. <sighs> you see this guy as being funny for decades and decades, and then you see him in that. Do you remember him in Natural Born Killers? I don't remember him in that movie. No. Oh, he I, was I, Julia Lewis's um, father. Dad, he was he? an abusive tyrant. Yeah, yeah. Nasty, nasty motherfucker. He was amazing though. You can't <laughs> take your eyes off him. Yeah. Yeah, you know when you talk about Robert Pattinson. Um, obviously, you think of Twilight in the of beginning, course, yeah. and now, now you don't even think about that anymore. He's just such a great actor. When, when it movie. was announced that he was going to be Batman, I, the first thing I thought was he deserves it. Mm -hmm. He deserves it. I mean, he he's grown, and it's it's kind of been a pleasure to watch. You know, I did a, a I was in the, the I had a part on the FBI's Most Wanted, and um, there was a guy. He was in Twilight. He he was one of the brothers. And he's on the show there. And me and him always get into a fight. I play a detective. He's an FBI agent. And there's a moment there where we're going to go at it. And then somebody breaks it up. But it was interesting talking to him about uh, Twilight and uh, what a phenomenon that was. You know? And then for, you know, to go, because he could have e easily gotten dismissed. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then when you think about, like, Adam Sandler, like you mentioned, him coming out of that trunk, If you if you haven't seen that movie uh what was the name of the beginning uncut gems uncut gems when he comes out, uh, out of the trunk naked i mean that's a tough scene to pull off oh, because, yeah absolutely <laughs> because you got your wife is there and you got to explain to no no it's okay just go back inside <laughs> <laughs> i'll figure this out the movie's unbelievable unbelievable i agree I agree. you know C cliff i just want to uh mention uh patriot day because i have a little uh clip not from the movie but from the real life thing and you played in the movie a uh, Sergeant McClellan uh, from the Watertown Police Department, a guy who I have spoken to on the phone. You gave me his number, and I tried to get him on the show when we were doing this in the studio because, to me, he's a great American hero. That could happen. That could happen. That is yeah, my I, proudest, proudest role. And let me tell you, I'm friends with him he, to this day. It's it's an it's an amazing story. And I, mm -hmm. let me just play this. Uh, I want to play this clip, um, and you can comment on it afterwards but it is it is an amazing uh, an amazing thing that occurred in this country and um let me just uh there's a million things you got to press to get this thing on the screen okay <laughs> oh, wow. the suspects began to lob devices at the police and um the first one was a huge explosion and then the follow-up explosions were were, were uh, smaller but they were improvised hand grenades that were being thrown at the offices. The big explosion was a bomb like the ones at the Marathon. Parts of it were embedded in the patrol cars. The grenades were packed with steel pellets, just like the Marathon bombs. Gun battle continued until one of the suspects ran out of ammunition and... Uh, one of the uh, sergeants uh, tackled him to the ground. A police officer ran out and tackled him, these men who had armed themselves with so many explosives. That's, that's correct. That's what happened. Uh, it, it probably would not be advised as, as a tactical move, but it shows the courage and commitment that officers have in, in attempting to, uh, to get uh, this thing under control. He was going to put the guy down before he had a chance to reload right. and risk his own life to do it. Right. He saw an opportunity and took it. Tamerlan Sarnayev was down, dying from multiple gunshot wounds. The younger brother gets in the car, backs over his older brother, drives away. What happened then? 
the suspect that, that uh, fled uh, abandoned the vehicle four blocks, four or five blocks away and uh, took off on foot. We determined that a 20 block perimeter had to be set up. And so began the lockdown of the city of Boston. Keep the doors locked and not open the door unless there is a. Cliff, amazing because that was the scene, the real life scene of the scene that you played in the movie. And it was such an emotional thing because he was two terrorist scumbags. And that's the only word you can use for these guys that attacked our country with bombs at, at, a, at an event that everyone should be enjoying a marathon. People watching the marathon lost their legs, lost their lives. I mean, and then for them to keep attacking our police and they had plans that night had they lived to go to New York city mm -hmm. and attack and attack times square. Do you want to just comment on how you felt playing that role? Oh, I mean, as I mentioned, it is my my proudest role, and I plan to have a, a good long career until I can't act anymore, but I still think that will be the, the most special role I've ever played. So from a lot of people that I've met, I've deducted that some of the baddest, toughest motherfuckers you will ever meet don't act that way until they need to. Sergeant John McClellan, gentlemen, happy go lucky, super friendly, big old softy. That dude has balls the size of church bells, man. <laughs> he fired his gun until he ran out of bullets. He took cover behind a tree. He did not have another bullet to shoot. He had a conversation with himself and said, what am I going to do here now? Am I going to die hiding behind this tree? Or am I going to die like a man and go out and do my best? He took his empty gun and he ran about 40 feet with his empty gun. And he clocked the older brother in the face with it, not knowing if he was going to get shot or uh, a bomb was going to land on him. Just he had to do it, you know, back. Grabbed him by his hair in one hand, pistol whipped him. The hand holding the hair went up. He looks at it. There's scalp, hair, and blood. Throws it away, grabs another clump of hair, continues to whip him with the empty gun. Now, that older brother, I mean, I'm not saying I want, I'm not saying he's a great guy, but that guy was a beast. He was not soft. I mean, he was an Olympic uh, level boxer. And it took, it took three of them, and he was still alive after getting run over by the car. But um, all three of those guys, you know, uh, Pugil P yeah, Pugiliese and Reynolds, so nice, absolute gentlemen, you know. And, uh, you know, it's hard to watch that footage without feeling something. I mean, we, it, we recreated it over five weeks, and I met all the people. You know, Cliff, can I just stop you for one second? Yeah, there's sure. a there's a great example of the most horrendous danger going into a tiny small town mm -hmm. and police from that town just rise to the occasion Dude, and go Watertown, up against Watertown, Massachusetts is like Mayberry RFD. Right. <laughs> but look what these guys did. They they, ran, they rose to the occasion like they were superstars. Dude, they deal with recycling in that town. I'm not saying I'm not dissing anybody. I take my hat hat off to them fully, but they don't see a lot of crime there. They thought they were pulling over a carjacker until the guy, you know, the older brother whips out the, the gun and then they start throwing bombs. And I mean, they were as, as tough and as grizzled as any any Boston police that night. You know, they. I mean, America owes them. One hundred percent. Yeah. What What a story. You know. Yeah. I would have like loved to have, I would have loved to have known the inside story between the battle between the Boston police and the FBI. Like who was gonna who was gonna yeah. run this case, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I'm sure there was a lot of headbutton between those two. Well, you gotta understand the average Boston cop would have worked for free that week. You know, just out of hey, this is our city. It's like going from New York City into a Nassau County or some or, or Suffolk County. Over here, you know, if they would have jumped on the LIE over here, they could have got off in Garden City. And Garden City has their own police department. And Garden City is full of mansions. And, uh, you know, everybody that you see on TV, 
<laughs> Brother, I'll 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 go one further and say it was Watertown's more like Scarsdale. I mean, really. Uh it, it is quiet. Smaller. It is quiet. But um But it just goes to show you that you know you train you train as a police officer. Yeah. Yep. You know, and you train for the worst. Yep. And even though you work in a place that is slow, yeah, you used to joke about it in uh on the on the NYPD, you worked in the 112, you know, they said that you were chasing squirrels. Mm -hmm. So there's you know what, I, I took a and the uh, 111. I, I really meant to say the 111 there. I took the I took a drive through with Sergeant McClellan one night and he showed me all the exact spots and the dude spent so much of his night saying hello to people. Everybody knew him. He was such a huge part of the community and so loved. And I in in part a part of it was the shootout, admittedly, but part of it was just because he cared, you know. I think the world of that man, you know, it was, a, it was an absolute pleasure to portray him. It's an absolute pleasure even just to meet him. You know, Cliff, imagine going through a career, say, in Watertown that was relatively quiet and the culmination near the end of your career, you get involved in that unbelievable shootout, bombs being thrown at you. You mm -hmm. think you have a touch of PTSD after that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think so. I it's think not, so. It's not my place to talk about it, but he's 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 told me he's uh, he's lost a few nights sleep. We all have it. We've yeah. done, you know, we all have that. Yeah. You know, but I, I mean, he had a very, very special event that can just that one event could cause it. That's mm -hmm. a global that's a global event. Yeah. It's not isolated to New York. That's the the Boston Marathon that's in America. It's a it's a it's a huge thing. What that that situation was so huge. Everybody in the world knew about it. So politics is a, a delicate topic these days and i'd love to talk politics when we're not online but if i may just say one thing about sergeant john mcclellan on his behalf this um animosity toward police that's going on right now he's a little sensitive to you know, i think we be, all are yeah i mean yeah. it's safe to say we all are yeah hey bill what do you think you want to jump into the um yeah we're, uh, we're gonna uh, Cliff will come back in a second. We're just going to go to a couple of commercials. So if you have to go to the bathroom or whatever you got to do, this is the time. This is the time to do it. It's, it's like I'm a, I'm a school teacher. Raise your hand and ask to go to the bathroom now. <laughs> hey, folks, if you're looking to relocate to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Carol Waters of the Beach Realty Group has been buying and selling property in the Myrtle Beach area for 11 years now. Carol and her husband, Rob Mahone, a uh, retired FDNY firefighter who started off on the NYPD, work as a team. Carol has been a multi-million dollar producer for the past 10 years. They have a great knowledge of all the aspects of the real estate industry. Carol is well known around the Irish community in New York. She worked in Fitzpatrick Manhattan Hotel for over 20 years behind the stick. Originally born in the Bronx and brought up in the County Mayo, Ireland. Contact Carol Waters for all your real estate needs in Myrtle Beach area. Carol Waters sells MB at gmail.com. The phone number is 914-261-6681. And folks, listen, I wish the best for you, but God forbid if you uh if you ever get in trouble, you want to have uh this attorney's phone number and email address in your contacts jmurray-law.com joseph murray is a retired nypd police officer who went on to become an attorney he was a great cop and he's a great attorney uh god forbid if i ever got in trouble i would love uh i wouldn't think of any to call anybody else he's a regular on the show he's our legal expert and he's a great attorney and he'll be in your corner uh, he's a gentleman and uh, if he takes you on as a client, consider yourself lucky. Phone number is 646-838-1702. Uh, and once again, it's jmurray-law.com. Folks, uh, Police Coffee is an officer-owned business dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends. Uh, they will provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by the people who know what it means to stay vigilant. And our specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavor is concerned. Our coffee is some of the best you'll find, but also helps serve an important cause, giving back to the community. 50% of our profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. To order coffee and related products from policecoffee.com, just go to that website. 
There are over seven types of coffee to choose from. 50% of profits go to offices, families in need. For a 10% discount, use code OTC10. So that's policecoffee.com is the website. And folks, I put my money where my mouth is. I just ordered some. It's it's on its way. I haven't gotten it yet. I'll report back to you uh, how, what I think of coffee. And I, I, I love drinking coffee. Folks, if you're looking for supplements, be sure to check out the products from firstdonutrition.com. As first responders, there are certain expectations in our performance on the job. We train hard and drill often to be able to perform at our best when duty calls. Whether it's hoofing over 100 pounds of gear or engaging in a spontaneous foot chase, we work out like our life depends on it, because it does. Two New York City firemen created this supplement line with hand-picked products that will not pop positive on any drug test for the first responders. Solid pre-workout products that will give you a good pump and a short-term strength boost that can help you power through your workout. Supplements that help with fat burning and weight loss and post-workout formulas that support recovery. Go to firstdonutrition.com. Use code off the cuff to get a 10% discount off your order. Amen. We're back. <laughs> We're back. Can you tell us um, a little bit about what it was like to work on Boardwalk Empire? I um, That was one of my favorite shows on HBO. Boardwalk Empire, they didn't... Um... You know the expression "God is in the details." Yeah, they adhered to that in Boardwalk Empire for sure. I mean, everything was was specific to the 1920s down to the socks. I am not exaggerating. Um, I mean, it was, that, that was one of the, the the greatest TV shows ever. I mean, top ten in my opinion, and I think you know a lot of what HBO does is a cut above, and that certainly cements HBO's legacy. Uh, that was my first real growing up acting job. Um, I was featured background, which is categorically an extra in the episode before. And it's funny because, you know, you, you're prominently featured in the scene and um, they can see you, which would one would think you're not going to get a principal role in that show. That happened exactly to me too. Go ahead. So, all right. So I played Jack Dempsey's trainer in the episode prior to the one I filmed as a principal actor. Yeah. And halfway through the day, I started to feel sick. Um, I had some type of stomach virus. And by the end of the day, I was experiencing the symptoms of a stomach virus without being graphic. <laughs> uh, and uh, my I, mean, I, I was lucky to have made it home uh, without experiencing an accident. <laughs> and for five days, I was begging for death. I was you know, just crawl into the bathroom every 10 minutes. It was horrible. And on day five, I was able to finally get some sleep. And when I woke up from an afternoon nap, I checked my phone and my manager said, Cliff, we have an audition for you. Boardwalk Empire, call me back to confirm. The audition was the next day. Somehow, some way, being sick as a dog for five days, my body started to heal. Adrenaline. I don't know how. Adrenaline. I, just, I wanted to be at that audition. Now, you bring it. So I got my sides. I started to heal. I started to feel better. I was, wasn't, you know, in a condition to, to run a marathon, but, you know, I was able to make it to the audition. And I didn't, after the audition, you know, an actor will have a voice that said, boy, you fucking sucked. Yeah. I didn't have that voice. I thought to myself, you know, I was pretty good. Next day, Cliff, you have a call back tomorrow. I had a call back in front of um, Terrence Winter and the casting director. Knocked it out of the park. Now, and, Terrence Winter is the head writer. Yeah, yeah, yep, the creator, runner, yeah, showrunner. Yeah. And you know, um, <laughs> that was my first time ever uh, speaking a line on a major uh, network television show. You know, you know, you. It's the same. I have the same exact story. I worked background as a featured extra on this show called uh, Della Ventura with Danny Aiello. The, the episode was oh, okay. about was about a drug dealer, and I was like one of his bodyguards. And while I was on the set, this other guy, uh, Peter uh, Bootsma, who happened to be the other bodyguard from this drug dealer that we were feature extra, he goes, "Hey, you got a headshot." 
And I said, yeah, I just happened to have one. I gave it to him and he brings it over. He goes, I know the first AD. Um, I'll give it to him and we'll see what happens. They call me up the next week. Are you really a boxer? Because on my on my uh, on my re- on my resume in the back of my headshot, remember how I don't know how long you've been around, but we used to staple our resumes on the back of our headshot. Yeah, sure. <laughs> back in the, yeah, and sure. Uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a boxer. I mean, I, I boxed. You know, I'm not a professional boxer, but I, I, you know, I know how to box. So I went for the audition, and I got the part. And it turns out that it was like the A story in a in a primetime series, you know, because there's an A and B story. So I had like eight scenes with Danny Aiello. Uh, his son, may he rest in peace, that just passed away. Uh, his son died? Rick. Yeah, Rick Aiello died. He just died a couple of weeks ago. And not I, only that. I think he was something of a stuntman, too. Well, no, Danny Jr. was the stuntman. Oh, Danny right. Jr. was the stunt coordinator on the show. He actually, uh, we worked on the stunts together. He passed away first. And then Rick just passed away. And also one of the guys that uh, played, uh, he played my fight manager. Um, He was also uh, on The Sopranos. He was um, his father in the flashback scenes. Tony Soprano's father. Oh, sure, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, he he just passed away too. I had a chance to act with him too. And uh, um, it just... It's it's sad, you know. That when but it's the same exact story. Like you 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 don't think that you're going to be able to get a part on a show when you were just on it, and here I was again, like well, dude, <laughs> two weeks later, I'm on the show I, again. I used to do a lot of background work, and I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to get from here to there? What are they doing differently? And then well, I, I used- realized, dude, you got to stop doing background work. First of all, secondly, you got to make the acting about the acting. You know. Yeah, once you get done with it, like I never went back after I had that part. I never went back. No, but no, also no. too, I used to work on As the World Turns, and As the World Turns, if you worked back around there long enough and they liked you, you would get what's called a five and under. Yeah, I remember five or and then I went from a five and under, and you know I used to go maybe you know maybe once a month or one, twice every three months, whatever. And then I got a, a day player, which turned out to be a contract part because I played the captain of a SWAT team in a hostage negotiation. So they had to keep me for the next week. So I had a contract part, and as the world turns, yeah. And, Cliff, uh, you know what I wanted to ask you about the um, the Irishman. You were in yeah. the Irishman, right? I was I I didn't love that movie, and one mm-hmm. of the things that I really objected to about that movie was putting these old bastard actors and making them look younger so they could be in that movie. I thought that was so wrong that they did that. I agree, like, man. Like, you know, Pacino, De Niro, they're in their, their mid-70s, late 70s, and they're trying to make them look like that. De Niro was totally unbelievable in his part. It didn't part. look good. It but he's be, he's good. beating up a guy that, you like, yeah, he could beat that guy up. You know, oh, you're when like, look. When, when he's stomping him? Yeah, yeah, I'm just <laughs> like, the guy. The guy's, he should have his walker with him as he's the beating the guy up. Was- I don't. I don't think they had the CGI well. And also, I would love should... to weigh in on this this topic. But the fact of the matter is, Martin Scorsese did not call you. You or me <laughs> ask a motherfucking opinion. Uh, That's true. Made, but you know, some, with the some... audience, with the yeah. audience members, and we're allowed to weigh in on it. You know. Yeah. I mean, it, the movie's not without merit. I think we could all agree on that. I've never seen Sebastian Maniscalco better. He fucking had a small role, and he absolutely murdered it. And what a great role to play. I mean, Crazy Joey Gallo, I mean, anybody knows the history of organized crime. That guy was, uh, that he was he was compelling, one of a kind. Guns and up the all other the guy, the English guy who always plays mobsters, too. Uh, oh, the Stephen scene. Graham. Yeah. Yeah, I love that guy, man. He's great. I oh, love I'm not, I'm not in, knocking. He's in, my, he's in my scene. They they cut my lines out. Boo hoo hoo. But, you know, it's part of the business. I wasn't really upset that I didn't get a big role in that because everybody who got a big role was a movie star. But, you know, the movie wasn't without merit. Now, they also didn't ask my opinion on this, but I'm going to weigh in. I don't think Frank Sheeran killed uh, Joey Gallo. They they say that that was Maddie the Horse Ionello. That is what they say. So they there's took poetic li- they took poetic that. license to, yeah, to the movie. Yeah, in a, in a yeah. huge way. You know, there's way. a lot of other movies about that situation too. Um the the mm-hmm. Irishman. No, not the Irishman. Um what was the other guy's name? Uh freak, that big guy. It wasn't even a popular movie, but he just walks around shooting everybody. They say, Well, the oh, guy the who, Iceman? No, no, no. The, well, the guy who is supposedly 
wrote the book on his deathbed or talked about it on his deathbed, put himself in all these places. They say that guy might have been a little uh, exaggerated in, in, in his. Uh, oh, dude, a lot of them are, you know, the but the main guy, the big Irish guy, they, they, they say it might not have happened that way. The way he said, was but, this in New York? No, no. The guy that, that based the whole thing on. Oh, the uh, what's the name? Is the name of the book? Um, I heard you paint houses. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah that's I think, what the Irishman is based on. That yeah, book. I think it's it's a little embellished. It was on his deathbed. Yeah, yeah. It, it, probably it, one is the same, it is the same story. Leave a legacy. Yeah. And uh, mind you, I'm not mock, uh, knocking uh, Martin Scorsese. I'm just saying oh. the CGI, it, it, for me as an actor, I always say, you know, just give it to a younger person. Yes. You know, do those scenes, man. As a younger, yes. I love those scenes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know why they, they had to do that. Yeah. Cliff, who is the best director that you've ever worked with and who would you rather... Well, I guess you don't want to name names if it's derogatory because no, I don't want I to put you in that. a bind. But who who, would, who do you like to work with as a director? I've been, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to work with so many, you know? Especially, I mean... Well, let's put it like this. My first acting... My first real acting job, which we mentioned, Boardwalk Empire, I was 34 turning 35. I'm not an overnight success story, but um, it's nice that some people see something in you. And um, uh, there's a, I've worked with a lot of good directors that are good, good technically. And this person I'm about to name is not only good technically, but she was such a pleasure to work with. Jodie Foster, hands down. I love her. I auditioned for the role of Officer Benson, um, who ended up going to Anthony DeSando. Really talented actor. You've seen him. He was uh, Frankie Beatles in New Jack City and um, Brendan Falone in um, The Sopranos. The role ended up going to him. Um, so they gave me the role of uh, Sergeant O'Donnell. Sergeant O'Donnell had four lines. Cool. I'll take it, man. Yeah. So I show up for my wardrobe fitting, and the wardrobe lady goes, Sergeant O'Donnell? They must have changed the script. This wasn't on the... This, this character didn't exist a couple days ago. <laughs> That's great. Oh, they interesting. Wanted, so um, so we start the film, and dude, all your favorite character actors are there. All of them, man. Like, I, I was, like, on edge a little bit. I mean, um, the guy who played Frank Sabatka in The Wire, uh, Chris Bauer. He's um, good. He's yeah, very John good. John Ventimiglia, Artie Bucco, yeah. um, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, Gustavo Fring. I'm looking around and seeing all these people I've, I've, I've watched for years. Clarice Starling's my director. So I'm bugging. I'm like, dude, am I the only one who's got a bartender after this? <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, Jodie Foster pulls me aside between takes and she goes, you know, you're doing a great job. Um, we loved your audition so much that we, we had to get you in the movie somehow. Wow, that's amazing. She yeah. wrote She wrote that in there for me. Wow. Yeah, I watched you real. Um, you were good. At, I really enjoyed your acting. I, Thank you. I, there was one part. I mean, it was you, you. You told this lady some sarcastic way, and that's all <laughs> I had to see. <laughs> sarcastic? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying it, it, the scene dictated the way you said the line, and I was like, because there's a lot of people who get a lot of work just because they fit they fit a certain look or a certain type, and then mm -hmm. there's an actor, you know. Never wanted to um, be that. I never wanted and, to be a gimmick, a gimmick you, actor. I was just watching your reel. I, I couldn't stop watching it. There's so many Thank good you. parts and, and so such good acting. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great reel. When I um when I was younger, I used to imagine making it as an actor, and I think to myself, you know, if it's ever, if I'm ever asked, uh, who do I owe my my career to, or or who do I have to say thank you to? I always imagined I'd be like, fuck you. I don't know anybody. Shit, I did it all myself. <laughs> but that's not true. I got a lot of help. I have my career because I have mentors. And at the top of the list, uh, Robert John Burke, Bobby Burke. Uh, you, you, I mean, you, if you turned on the TV and changed the channel five times, you'd see him at least once. I am not exaggerating. He was Captain Tucker in Law and Order SVU. He was Bart Bass in Gossip Girl. He was in, he was played a priest in uh, Rescue Me. The guy's, the guy works. Uh, absolute gentleman, man. He's been very nurturing to me in my career. Chaz Palminteri, another mentor of mine. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, told me I could do it when I didn't know. Uh, Jay Giannone, he's not a movie star, but he works regularly. A guy named Jerry Dean, 
uh, was very supportive of me. Uh, and there's too many to name, but I want to make it clear. I have a career because people helped me. But Cliff, you know, that's, that's almost any field. People, when they see a talent in you and they see the drive in you, mm -hmm. they want to help you because mm -hmm. acting is so easy to quit because A, it's so hard to make money at it. B, it's so hard to get good at it. And C, uh, C, all the rejection you get is hard to take. I want to agree with you, but but it's not necessarily true. Acting is hard to quit. I want to agree with you, but it's not if you're a real actor. Acting for me right now would be impossible to quit. Yeah, I don't I stop. care how bad things get. I'm going to see this fucking thing through to the end. And well, you've came, you've came, you've come pretty far with it. That's thank you. you know. Thank you. Check yeah, it out. I mean, that's back in 2008, 2009. Um, the economy tanked and people were getting their houses foreclosed on. It's a bad time in America. Hard to get a job. I moved back from Los Angeles to New York to live with my girlfriend at the time. Um, I had a hard time getting a job. I finally got a job at La Dan, New York Times four-star restaurant, Michelin three. Waiters there make between eighty and dollars $100,000 a year. Busboys have Rolex watches. I swear to God they do. Captain's $200,000 a year. I really needed this job. Cliff, I ate there once, and I can testify we had a $500 gift certificate, and we had to put $150 in after sure. the $500 sure. gift. Yeah, yeah. We were like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm sure. Anyway, yeah. so I, I, I go through my, uh, my first week of training. Not a smile in the place, man. The staff is miserable. They have so much money for what they do, but they're completely miserable. Everybody gets Sunday off. The next day you get off is later on in the week. So nobody has two days off in a row. You don't have a, a, a decent weekend. And the, my first day out of training, I'm about to go in the restaurant. And like it was like an invisible hand pushed me and said, no, you can't go in there. You're going to blink and be 65 years old. You can be miserable. All you're going to have to show for it is a fucking Rolex watch and, you know, in a house. And... <laughs> And you're never going to have the life you want. You're going to be miserable for the next four years. You're going to get addicted to the money. And then you're never going to be an actor. I had $75 in the bank. I picked up the phone. I called the manager. I said, hey, listen, man, I know this is kind of weird, but thanks, but no thanks. I can't work there. I appreciate the opportunity, but I quit. And I vowed. Before mankind, before God, before myself, that I was going to make it as an actor or die trying. And that's then a great, that's a great story. Thank you. That's Thank you. great. That's Thank what you. it takes. Part of, it it takes. is part part of my story. Yeah. Cliff, do you ever get recognized anywhere? Dude, yeah, it's kind of funny. People, <laughs> especially when something's on. Uh, I, I've been recognized like I. A couple of years ago, I started a job as a bartender and I was in full uni uniform. I was on my break between uh, lunch and dinner. And I'm standing um, in my uniform on the street on my phone and goes, we put billions. Pe people <laughs> recognize me while I'm serving <laughs> drinks to them. Uh -huh. That's great, man. Yeah. You know, I, I, was, Cliff, I, I was actually walking on the boardwalk at Jones Beach and some guy goes, hey. Aren't you Cannon from Police Off the Cuff? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, no way someone recognized me. I was going to make a lot of noise and bring a crowd around, you know? I, <laughs> I had the, um, recognized, man. You guys have a great show. Well, I had the you. Unmovers commercial. The thing was running for two years, all day, every single day. And I was working, and I still do, as a concierge in the city. Um, and people used to come into the building all the time and go, and they just would say the line from the commercial. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, it's one of those things. It's like, it's humbling, but I don't mind like being out there in the mix. I don't want to be that person uh, that uh, if, if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. I'm a real dude. Well, here's something I'm a little sensitive to is you'll see somebody every day and they're an asshole to you. And you're like, all right, what the fuck's their problem? Mm -hmm. And then one day you, you see them and they're super nice to you. And they're like, where are you on manifest? I'm uh, like, whoa. What are we friends now? 
Uh -huh. You didn't like me before. What are we? You like me now that you saw me on TV? Fuck you. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of uh -huh. after Patriots Day, I changed my name on on social media because I was like, you know what? I don't want a bunch of people saying, oh, you know that Cliff Moylan. We were always like this. You know, I was always very uh -huh. supportive. Fuck yeah. you. Hey, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, it's funny is that we both suffer from the same thing. Uh, that you have a, a the Boston accent. I didn't even detect it that much with you though. I worked but on. I, I have a very heavy New York accent. No. Nah. So I'm watching. I'm watching your reel. I'm watching your reel, and I'm looking at you in in a, in one of your TV shows, or maybe it was a movie. It's a period piece. It's like from from uh, I don't know from 1912 uh, downtown. It's like, was it the Nick? But but your accent doesn't change at all. You still the, was it the Nick where the ladies paying me off? Yeah, yeah, in the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, yeah. That was a, that was a lot of fun. Steven Soderbergh was the director. That's great. I mean, that's another guy. It's amazing to work with. Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, one of the greatest. Absolutely. Absolutely. Versatile, too. He does a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, the accents, are, they are what they are. They get you the work. I mean, yeah. I don't ever, if I read a, a part for New York, I never put on anything. I just say it exactly the way I would say it. No, because you I don't have, have such to. a New York accent. Anyway, I don't have to add anything to it. Dude, and that's not only true of your accent, but that's true of your acting. Invent, yeah. not, invent nothing, deny nothing. That's David Mamet. Dude, just talk the way people talk. Now, when I'm talking to you guys right now, am I acting? No, I'm just we're just having a conversation. Now, if I said talk to you like this, right, right. afternoon, <laughs> good evening, you know, it's well, well, you know, Cliff. If I took anything away from acting class, it was always my acting teacher always used to say, "Bill, you being you is much more interesting than you trying to be somebody else." And he would yeah, always absolutely. say that. You know, yeah, so I'm sure that's an acting line. That yeah. all acting teachers say that, right? I had a I had a teacher tell me something I remember every single day. The most interesting thing you can be is real. And that applies to acting, that applies to everything, you know? Yeah. Can I have yeah. 60 seconds to, to, to plug something? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Cool. Go ahead. My buddy uh, and I, grew, Charlie Sakoch, um, grew up in the same neighborhood. And um, there was a, a fixture in the neighborhood. It was kind of a vagrant, but he was beloved by people. His name was Milty. Um, he was kind of like an heirloom in human form. You know, he's passed down from generation to generation, hung out with all of us teenagers. He was a World War II veteran. And um, one day I was just talking shit to Charlie and said, how cool would it be if we, uh, we got a Milty t-shirt? So Charlie did the artwork and uh, we pitched it to College Hype. It's a local... Um, uh, T-shirt embroidery printing company in Dorchester, where I'm from, and we have the we have the oh, Milty yeah, T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> this is available this week at College Hype, and from this week on, that is a kind of a passion project. That's pretty cool. <laughs> this another thing. This uh, family I grew up down on, down the street from the Voskeviches, uh Their grandparents escaped Nazi. Um, occupied Poland on skis with nine dollars, made it to the, the United States and uh, went into business handcrafting sunglasses. The name of their company is Randolph Engineering. These are standard uh, issue for military fighter pilots, handcrafted, American made. Badass. Fine sunglasses. <laughs> you look awesome there. Tom Cruise and Risky Business there. No, no, they're like, they're, they're they're like coming out. Anya Stajakis. She makes soap and skincare products. Anya's herbals. And lastly, my manager's named Brad Belmont from Red Letter Entertainment. My commercial agent is Carol Ingber from Ingber and Associates. I'm in the latest edition of Boston Man magazine. An article was written about me by uh, Jim Botticelli from Dirty Old Boston. That is all the pitching I have to do. Hey, Cliff, you know something? I love you, buddy. I'm so happy that uh, you came on the show. I'm so happy that you're doing well and acting. I know this is, I mean, it's a tough, tough business. Uh, you know, it seems some people get get a lot of things maybe they don't deserve, and other people keep working their balls off. And if you stick to it, you're going to be a big star one day, you know? I think Thank you very much. Man. I think you're a phenomenal actor, and your work ethic is great. You know, uh, I spoke about Danny Aiello earlier, and uh, I just want to mention what a great guy he is one more time. Um, you know, 
after I did that uh, the TV show with him, his stand-in, he was doing a movie. His stand-in broke his leg skiing. So they called me up, asked me if I wanted to do it. Now, I'm 6'4". Danny, at best, was 6'1". They told me, he goes to me, just scratch down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had a chance, whatever they were filming, I uh, forget the movie's name, but uh, William Forsyth. He's a good uh, actor. You know, yeah. Now, he so he's, Gravano. Yeah, he's in the film as well. So at some point, we're going to break for lunch. And uh, what was tradition on this set was they'd all hang out. We were filming in the village on 4th Street. And they'd all sit outside this restaurant and they eat. And then and Bill, William Forsythe, says to me, hey, you want to take a walk? I got to go over here. So I'll, I went with him. And he went to a couple of different um, agencies. And he stopped in to say hello. Management companies. All these different uh, you know, CAAs or whatever. Whatever was going on in New York City at the time. And I was young as an actor. But I had a chance to see him go and network instead of having lunch. And I always thought that was really interesting. Like, you know, he wasn't going to just sit down at lunch and, and bullshit. He was in New York. He was filming. I'm going to go out and see if I can get some other work. Let me let me stop off at these places, say hello, show my face and see what's going on. And that's what it's about. You know, it's really that hustle that I, I had a chance to witness at, at young. But that's what you were. You remind me of as well. You know, Thank that, you. That, that hustler. Thank you. You know? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's important to promote yourself in some ways, but do it in an organic way. You know, I don't walk up to important people and say, oh, I love your shoes. There's no uh -huh. one going to fucking respect you, you know? <laughs> nah, I mean, nah, you nah, kind of, nah. you know, if, if you're authentic, I think people can pick up on that. 100%. Yeah, you got to chill, man. Yep. Yeah. You, you, know, guys my, you guys want to meet my son? Yeah, yeah, of course. Where is he? going to be his dog, Hagler, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. That's that's Hagler. <laughs> Marvin Hagler. For, there he goes. Hey, what's up, Hagler? Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, why, why is the dog named Hagler? What else are you going to name a dog? Marvin Hagler, right? That's, uh, that's my favorite athlete in any any sport. Marvin just, Hagler. Yeah, we just passed. He didn't whine, didn't cry, didn't talk shit. Bell rang. God help the other guy. <laughs> Yeah, I just watched uh, Vito Antifermo against Marvin Hagler, the, the, the both fights. Vito and the Mosquito. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. Marvin, Marvin Hagler promoted fight. it by well, going over the fly swatter and talk, calling Vito, Vito the Mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> From Brooklyn. You know, and, yeah. and I, I met Vito if, uh, in acting, too, because he's an actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I met he's him on Godfather, Godfather 3. 3. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well guys, we have hit, uh, we're actually over an hour. So let me it's just. It's been uh, a lot of fun, guys. Thank it's, you very it's much. Been, it's been amazing. Folks, just again, I have to plug Police Off the Cuff. If you're not subscribed to us, please su subscribe to us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up. Hit that bell. Uh, we also have a Patreon with three tiers. I'm not going to do all that. We also now have members to our channel. And uh, that's another thing I'll go into more the next show. We have some amazing guests coming up. I, as I said, we just booked Sammy the Bull Gravano. We're, we don't want to become a mob show, but, you know, when these big mobsters want to come on our show, we'll say, come on on, you know, they can tell their story and people, people love listening to mobsters. You know, think of all the movies made about the mob people listening. They love to hear these stories. And tonight, you know, I, uh, I just, I'll tell a quick story about where I met Cliff like seven or eight years ago. It must be now we took a, um, eight week stand up comedy course together. And, uh, we had a lot of fun. It was a lot of yeah. fun. I, I stayed with it for about six years. I still do it here and there, but the, the podcast has become all encompassing for me. And I, I just don't have time to do stand up right now. You Not know saying, because I, you said that, we should hit an open mic. That's right. We should do it. We should. Right. Some of I, did, I did a show about a month ago with Mark. It was a retirement party and it was a big crowd there. And I was like, I haven't been on stage for like yeah. eight months. <laughs> so it was it, funny, though. Jay I saw, you I saw your um, I saw your uh, your class. You know when you when you take the uh, class, the end of it, and it was great. Thank you. It was, it was just <laughs> like you. a like a regular stand up set. You want? He had a lot of fun. My my mother gathered her friends around and goes, "Oh my my son Cliff, he's he's an actor. You know, I'm gonna I'm put on his reel." And she put on my comedy clip. <laughs> uh, oh god. <laughs> oh man. Oh uh, yeah. That... So Cliff, I was mortified. <laughs> <laughs> Hi mom. 
That's great. It's on YouTube if you guys want to see it, folks. It's on there. <laughs> Just put in Cliff Moylan. That's, That's right. great, man. Guys, uh, this was effortless, man. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you guys. Cliff, I told you, it's just we have a conversation for an hour. That's all we do, you know? That's all it is. But Police Off the Cuff fans, you guys, thank you so much for listening. This is my good buddy, uh, future star actor Cliff Moylan yeah. uh, from Boston and with his dog Marvin Hagler Jr. there. And uh, <laughs> on behalf of uh, myself and Mark DeMeo, folks, thank you so much for listening and have a great night.